Hello, everyone, and welcome to Performance Anxiety's 42nd live online reading event. It's hard to believe we've been doing this 40 plus times since 2019. My name is Tom Snarsky, and I'm so thrilled and thankful to be hosting this evening's reading, along with Katz Asparagus and Basil. Basil's scratching himself over here. I'm sure you'll hear him momentarily. Um, but we are very excited to be here with you and with a wonderful group of poets and writers who are going to share some work with you tonight. Um, in case you haven't listened in before, Performance Anxiety is an online reading series of mostly poetry, but not all or always poetry, as you'll see, hosted via Skype, usually on the third Thursday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. At each of our events, we have a group of invited readers who come on to share a selection of their work with us, and we have special emphasis on and appreciation for new shit on the bleeding edge of their writing practice. So if you ever have like a group of poems at close at hand and you want to join us, um, we always have slots every month. We're always looking for people who would be interested to read. And if you have that friend who's a poet who you think more people need to hear, um, please, please consider getting in touch with us. You can email us via our email. So you can email me at Tom Snarsky, T-O-M-S-N-A-R-S-K-Y at gmail.com. You can get in touch with me on Twitter or Instagram, or you can reach out to our Twitter account, which is at Performance Anxiety P. E-R-F-O-R-M-A-N-C-E-A-N-X-T. Um, or you can get in touch with the other co-organizer of Performance Anxiety, who is Kristen Garth. And I'm very excited to introduce Kristen, not only as our first reader for tonight, but also someone who I think is going to take us a little out of our uh, poetry comfort zone for the evening, which is always <laughs> a good thing to you know, keep us on our toes. So without any further ado, Kristen Agarth is a woman childish pushcart wrestling nominated sonneteer and a best of the net 2020 finalist. She's the author of The Meadow, which is both an amazing collection of poems that I loved and reviewed, but also a novel from Alien Buddha Press uh, coming out this month, October 2022. Um, also 26 more books of poetry and prose beyond that. She's the dollhouse architect of Pink Plastic House, which is a tiny journal. And of course, she's the co-organizer of this very reading series. So thank you, Kristen, for leading us <laughs> off. Take it away. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm going to read something for the Meadows soon. But first, I'm going to read a, um, a little Halloween poem, since I'm going to read prose in, um, in a bit. But um, it just got published today. So I guess it's new shit, you know. Um, but um, in uh, Suburban Witchcraft magazine. And it's called Deep Trouble. Black silver clouds follow wherever you go. A flood of misfortune if you should chance repose. The unfortunate hollow you chose a year ago for one night of romance, everyone knows, became a lake replete with zombie mermaids. Its drowned population by devastation remade without their feet an essential. Legs made transformations to tails, the decomposing flesh quilted in semblance of scales. Devoured all of the tourists who chanced to dip in a gilded simp swimming hole they are convinced used to be a town. Bed in a carriage is where you sleep. If you keep moving, trouble never gets steep. And then I'm going to read a little section from the meadow and it's kind of a, um, it's a section about a whipping. And so <laughs> bear with me, <laughs> it, it'll be good for Halloween. <laughs> but it's how or the main character goes to the meadow because this is a book about BDSM, but it's about um, really trying to go to a spiritual place through a physical place. And, um, but it starts with a whipping. Scarlet was sure she was in no way prepared for what was coming, but she nodded. Speak, pony. Yes, ma'am. Good, because I'm ready to take my little pony for a ride. And with that, Evelyn stopped um, back and picked up a crop. The euphoria of the touching twisted inside her to terror and dread. Before she could brace herself, Scarlet heard a terrifying whistle and felt a riding crop strike so hard across her back her feet danced under her, involuntarily, to the rhythm of her screams. While she writhed in agony and her mouth still complained of that cruel blow, the next one came stronger. A blow so hard and vicious it was hard to imagine. It came from such a thin, genteel arm. The one that followed crumpled her chest and reduced her to terrified sobs. And in that state, sunken and sobbing, the blow still came, twisting and angling her body to protect all the new burning 
fit in stinging places and only offering slices of virgin flesh, the blows still came. While she was reduced to shaking and begging, turning her head as much as possible to catch Evelyn's hard eye and pleading with her, please stop this, I'll do anything, the blow still came. While spectators, including Martin, started to disperse from the room with uncomfortable murmurings, I can't listen to this, the blows still came. An older man held, heading towards the solace of the bedrooms stopped to shake his head, looked at Evelyn and said, I don't know how you can keep going with her making all this fuss. Evelyn smiled at him sarcastically and struck Scarlet again. I'm having a ball. She can beg all day. I haven't heard a safe word. And then, as if to prove something to this dubious crowd, Evelyn was on her fingernails, digging into the meat of her arms, hands shake, shaking her swept and drenched body hard. They think that you don't want this. Tell them that you want this. Tell them now or I'll stop. Evelyn shook her harder. I'm going to walk away. And through her sobs, Scarlet screamed, I want this. The older woman released her hard grip on her target shoulders and wrapped her arms tight around her chest and squeezed her. Good girl, Evelyn whispered in her ear, wiping away her tears and sweat, rubbing all the angry red places tenderly, kissing her exposed neck. Then she let her fingers wander inside Scarlet again, broken down and degraded as she now was by the pain. Scarlet could not forego the small gift of pleasure. She writhed against those fingers in abandon, exposing her body in undignified postures, craving relief like a panicked, broken animal. The puppy and the watcher looking at her now with the same cool, curious appraisal she'd earlier given them. Evelyn leaned in close and whispered, we seem to have cleared the room of the Philistines now. I really want to use the single tail. You'll safe word, you'll safe word soon when I do, I promise, all right? Panting for far too much for words from Evelyn's thrusting, distracting fingers, Scarlet nodded. She knew Evelyn was right. She didn't have much more to give, but she would give what she had until she finally could not. She would see this through. Evelyn pulled her fingers away and moved toward her, her bag to collect the whip. Feeling those fingers leave her body and the warm embrace of Evelyn's skin retreat from where it touched her own, leaving her bare and trembling, Scarlet never felt lonelier. She sobbed, not from rough touches, but from loneliness and desperation. Evelyn's absence felt like absolute hopelessness to her, as hopeless as her survival of the mysterious sting of this whip. She would soon know all its secrets and lessons. Though she dreaded the whip, she knew its inescapable truth would set her free. And in this abject loneliness, she turned toward the frame. It was the only thing that remained with her, supported her in this suffering. She held on to it like it was her only friend, as in this moment it truly was. Out of the side of her eye, she saw the puppy and the watcher move farther away from her, gone from her view entirely. Everyone gave the whip wide berth. Everyone respected it. It was only meant for her. Scarlet heard a terrible crack, but no follow through of pain, and she realized it had been a warning, a tease, a show. It made her shake and sob almost as if the pain had come. In her mind now, she begged for it to come and take her away to hide in the lush green blades and yellow flowers. She held the frame and waited to be free. Then she felt its dark embrace as if it were a burning hot brand spiked with sparks of electricity that wrapped around her body, infusing pain from either side to the deepest part of her core. It doubled her over and made her scream, though at first no sound came. Scarlet smelled damp dirt. Her thighs were covered in dewdrops and pollen from the thigh-high wet thrush and wildflowers. Scarlet was deep inside that me meadow when the second blow hit, just as hard. Even there, there so far away, she heard her fierce scream that turned into an unmistakable actual word, red. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kristen, for starting us off on such a vivid and, uh, you know, bright red, like appropriately <laughs> seasonal note. Um, that again was Kristen Garth, 
who you can find on Twitter at Lola and Jolie, L O O L A A N D G J O L I E, on Instagram at Kristen Ingrid Garth, K R I S T I N I N G R I D G A R T H. And you can keep up with all of Kristen's awesome stuff that she's doing at her website, which is Kristen Garth, K R I S T I N G A R T H dot com. And keep an eye out for The Meadow, the novelization of Kristen's amazing poetry collection um, from Alien Buddha Press coming out this month, right, Kristen? I think. Yeah, it's already out. It actually came out early. It was supposed to come out on the um, 16th, and it came out a little bit before that. So, yep, it's out. You can order it. Amazing. Many many congratulations on its arrival. (laughs) It's physically right there. You can uh, hold it in your hands (laughs) very, very soon, as I hope many of you will. (laughs) <laughs> Thank awesome. You. So with that beautiful, beautiful start, I'm really excited to introduce our second reader of the evening in Luna Ray Hall. Luna Ray Hall is a queer trans non-binary writer. They are the author of Space Neon Neon Space out from Variant Lit in 2022. Also, no matter the diagnosis from Game Over Books in 2023, The Patient Routine from Bridget's Gate Press in 2023, and Loudest When Startled from Yes Yes Books in 2020, which was long listed for for the 2020 Julie Sook Award. They are the winner of the 2013 Patsy Lee Corps and Memorial Award for Poetry. Their poems have appeared in the Florida Review, the Rumpus and Raleigh Review, among others. For more information, you can visit Luna Ray Hall, L-U-N-A-R-E-Y-H-A-L-L.com. And before that, you can hear Luna's amazing poems. Thank you so much for being with us, Luna. I'm excited to hear what you're going to share tonight. Oh, I think you are muted right this moment, though. Oh, awesome. Hi, everyone. <laughs> All right, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to read a handful of poems. Uh, I'm going to start with one um, from Space Neon Neon Space that just came out a little bit ago. Um, and then I'll move on to newer stuff. So uh, this first poem is entitled Say It With Me. We want a queer ass story with queer-ass characters and a queer-ass setting with them queer-ass earrings and those queer-ass flicks and subtle shades of gemstone, tongues ravaged by love, that queer-ass elder letting us know that new they, them, tick-tocking their queer-ass off, that salt breeze from Lake Superior bristling those queer-ass nose hairs and all our hands in the water, sand caught in the fat of our cuticles, that gentleness when night begins to take over and there ain't a hint of trauma, zero sadness in this story and fuck you for thinking otherwise. Um, This next poem um, is entitled Google. Uh, I wrote a bunch of these poems based on Uh, Googling health anxiety symptoms. So that's kind of where they came from. Uh, This first one's entitled Google, how do you know a common cold? In a field, I am naked, trimming the dirt and and grass with my palms. Nothing is not always what it appears. A thick cold sweeps in, the field opens a mouth through which I walk every single time. Um, and this is another one of those Google poems. It's a uh, Google prion diseases can be acquired by. I am remembered. I am reminded of Kuro, a fatal insomnia of last night's Google to feel something. Hear me out. I am numb to viruses, numb to bacteria, fungi, just another white tongue coating to me, just debris. Parasites, alien and gray, Roswellian bulbous heads so known, but those diseases that mock our proteins. Mm. How devious, how irresistible, how my heart pulses across my callous sternum, how something so basic can be so deadly, such a centerpiece to our structure, how misguided, misfolded our bodies can become. Um, this next one's entitled, um, my mother got cancer before me. And I know what you were thinking. It's not a competition, but it feels like one. 
I'm worried she's in the winner's circle of wasting away, and I'm in the crowd booing the award ceremony. Like, I lost the one thing I thought I was good at. I'm worried no one will ever associate me with cancer. That all my worry was for naught. But I'm most worried that she'll be better at it than me. That she is better at it than me. The key true to veins and shedding, swollen fist and nerve panic, body barely able to generate any warmth despite the layers, despite the layers. Irrigated throat, lungs restive at the growth within them, plural space draining to satisfy the tumor's want, porthole shoulder and infusion skin so easily ragged, frayed peach, the fatigue, threadbare face and holy murmur, the dying, but especially the dying. Um, and this is another mother poem. Um, I've written dozens of these over the last couple of years. So <laughs> uh, this, this poem is entitled, My Mother Asks Me to Write a Poem in Which I Am Alive at the End. And it looks like rain, yard thrush empty, damp, sidewalks absent of dog walkers and bikers, a hornet burrows under the flake siding, metallic wings fluttered, uh, cold and moist. And it looks like rain, my partner says, sky ooze, sun, bright still, roof drum tap with the patter, clouds not even trying to look nasty, my hand pressed against the screen door, mesh squaring, my hand skin, and it cleans like rain. Streets swept free of garbage, fast food bags stuttering on the sewer grate, and it tastes like rain. Air seeping, coating my lungs full, Tongue dried soil now wet, and it smells like rain. A church, a pratkor, the the worship of thrumming nostrils, and it looks like anything, anything, and the swaying shimmer of droplets. Um, and then I'm going to read some new, pretty new ones uh, within that I've written in the last month or so, and then one that I've written in the last week or so. Um, and these are all about queerness and identity. Um, this first one's entitled, Wearing a Dress for the First Time. Do you want me to be honest? My mother says after this long pause over the phone, I just told her how uncomfortable I felt at work all day, the luminous fixations, the let me turn my head away from your non-binary ass looks, the chewing at the surface of my lips until they were raw, an anxious tick, a all day turned wild shame, dancing, throbbing shame, molten booms of lightning shame, yeah. I finally replied, the word tumbling off the cliff of my swollen lip. I'm just absorbing what you told me. First the new pronouns, now women's clothing. Does that mean you are a woman today? Or how does that work? I can hear the quivering swell in her breathing, the strained coughing between sobs before. I'm sorry. I don't quite understand. Um, this next poem is entitled um, Wedding Planning with Family. Oh, so we can say girlfriend, a girlfriend, and girlfriend, a fiancé. I guess the wedding won't be weird then. We won't have to explain eccentric silken veil and mustache crown, tux, and dress. It's the best of both worlds should be played during the reception. I can enjoy the day and won't have to explain tackle box bloodline, thread and hook cast into the lake's open mouth shiver. Maybe a suit would suit you, Sill. We wouldn't have to explain how easy it would be to pretend for a single day. And then um, I'm going to read one more, and this is the one that is super new and super rough, so... Uh, Take it, take it as it is. Um, every line is an attempt at a body. 
Jupiter ash and star matter. Starved bone bleach. A realm, a massacre, overwhelming riot. Yellow pink snapdragon, thumb rubbing the throat, mouth squeezed open, shouting, shame. Shaved down to blood and burn, grape seed oil, skin puppet, a ghost story, a cocoon. Bra strap, shoulder bite, cross arm pull over top, tiny pockets full of little deaths, under tongue pill and bloodstream, purple mat, lustrous cig cigarette, are you pregnant or might become pregnant, parasite and host. Welcoming the cat call, face pressed against the pillow, bills that forgot the dead name, scrunchy wrist, duchess slant, hello miss, eyebrow arch, Mary Jane pumps, all of heaven, a, kin a kingdom of forgiveness, a shadow in the shape of hips. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Luna, for those amazing, amazing poems. If you uh, heard little like ding noises while Luna was reading, it was because the chat was blowing up with just loving their work so much. That was that was Luna Ray Hall, um, who again, you can find on the internet and the socials at Luna Ray Hall, L-U-N-A-R-E-Y-H-A-L-L. -L -L. Um, and check out from Variant Lit their new chat book, Space Neon Neon Space. Um, it's just out now, right? And it's a chat book or a full length book. Can you help me with that? Yes, it just came out in August. It's a chat book. Fantastic. Check it out. Variant Lit is a beautiful theme of our evening because Luna has their amazing new book from um, Variant Lit. And our next reader also has an exciting new release um, from Variant. So we're really, really excited um, to move along in our reading order uh, and to welcome Deirdre Donklin as our next reader. Deirdre Donklin's novella, Catastrophe, is available from the Texas Review Press, and her flash fiction chapbook, How to Start a Coven, is forthcoming from our very own Variant Lit. Um, Deirdre, thank you so much for joining us, and we're really excited to hear you share um, new shit, publish shit, any stuff that you want to read. We're, we're thrilled to have you. Great. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so wonderful and affirming and nice. Um, I was going to just read some stuff from the chapbook that's coming out in you know, a crass bid to get you all to order it from Variant Lit. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, um, it's going to be a flash fiction chat book, so not poems, but really short little stories. So I hope that still counts. Uh, the first one I'm going to read is a little spooky uh, for Halloween. Uh, the chat book is called How to Start a Coven. So several of them are quite spooky. Uh, but this one is about inheriting anxiety from your mother essentially which i've been thinking about quite a lot since i am like six months pregnant now and i'm like this is a theme it's called worry my mother writes the book of my life and binds it with skin each year it's another worry this is the life you'll have if you start doing drugs at 13 she tells me when i'm 11 i won't start doing drugs i say not now you won't i've bound that possibility up she says I receive the books on my birthdays. They're mine to peruse. At night, when I can't sleep, I slip one off of my bedroom bookshelf and stroke its smooth spine. First, it's drugs, then it's unwanted teen pregnancy, then a car accident, then a cult, then a man who beats me. None of these futures come to pass because my mother writes them down in obsessive detail. I watch myself bruise. I see myself on ventilators in the hospital. I see myself locked up with 50 other women for a homicidal incident involving a charismatic cult leader who gets killed by the FBI. I put the books back. They sleep on my shelves as I go to school, go to college, get a job, and marry a nice man who loves me and is kind to my mother. On my wedding day, my mother is shaking with relief as she hands me a slim volume of possibilities. He'll make a decent living. He won't sleep around. You'll have the normal ups and downs, she says, her face white. But mostly you'll be happy. Thanks, Mom, I say. I was up all night, my mother says, thinking of everything. When I take the book, I notice that the skin is still bleeding a little. A drop of red blood lands on my train, but my mother's eyes are too heavy-lidded to notice. I leave the stain. I think it's good luck. When my daughter is born, my mother is thrilled and underneath a little sad. 
A few weeks after we come home from the hospital, my mother comes into my room with a toolbox. What's this? I ask, still sleepy euphoric from hormones and love. You'll have to start making her book soon, my mother says. So soon, I ask. I only remember the book starting when I was 11, but my mother tells me that she started before I was born. Miscarriage books, the size of postage stamps, stillborn books, the size of the palm of her hand. When she grows, the books grow, my mother says. So for now, they can be small. She opens the toolbox and I see the slim, sharp knives. Can it wait, I ask, but she shakes her head. I'll help you with the first one, she says. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid she won't gain any weight, that she won't thrive, I say. My mother reaches out and cuts away the skin on my thigh. It hurts, but I don't wince. She peels it off and uses iodine from the toolbox to sterilize the wound. She writes my worries for me, just this once. As her head is bent over the paper, I notice the patchwork of scars on my mother's skin, rectangles of binding excised from her arms and legs, her neck and back. I never noticed before how white the scars were. When she's finished writing, my mother binds my worries into the book and I feel it like an exhale. I know my daughter will be able to breastfeed, will gain weight, will thrive. I feel it in the throb of my wound. Better, my mother asks. You can stop now, I tell her. You can stop making books for me. That's not how it works, my love, she says. After she leaves, I find her biggest book yet on the coffee table, hundreds of pages about my motherhood, about my own daughter, about the world. I hold the thick book in my hands for a moment, but I don't read it. My daughter's cries pull me back to the bedroom and the small worries of eating, sleeping, growing. Before I pull my daughter to me, I, pull, I put my mother's latest book on the shelf with all the others. It bleeds. Thanks, guys. I see. I'm seeing everybody in the in the chat. You're all being very nice. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, dokie. So kind of spooky. And now I will move on. Let's see. Maybe <laughs> this one's kind of weird, <laughs> but you guys seem kind of weird, so I feel like it will be cool. Uh, it's more of a stream of consciousness situation. It's called Dream Sequence. Um, okay. In my dream life, I walk up a mosque spiral staircase to the top of an opalescent tower. I'm a princess in my dream life. There's a white owl with a flat face perched on my shoulder who coos cliches in my ear. Shoot for the moon, the owl says. Even if you'll miss, you'll land among the stars. In my real life, there are glow-in-the-dark stars attached to my ceiling fan and a spider stuck weaving a web between the glass of my bedroom window and its screen. I go to school, and I'm not a princess. I have a dog that my family found skinny, starving, tied to a tree. Nothing flies. In my dream life, I catch my teeth in a bloody pile in my hands, and that's how I know something is coming to invade my kingdom. I'm not a princess, but a king, so I wear a crown made of bloody teeth and ride a white owl to the battlefield. There, I fight the falling debris of exploded stars. I win. In my real life, I grow up. I wear a school uniform that makes me look like Lucy from Peanuts. I make a few good friends, but we grow apart. In my dream life, they call me the toothless king, a destroyer and creator. There is peace in the gardens of my kingdom and pink roses with blue eyeballs at their centers unfold and make the world smell like freshly cracked pistachios. In my real life, I go to a small college in Pennsylvania and every single one of my new friends gets drunk and wakes up with a boy's fingers inside them or a boy's body on top of them. Twice, I carry a smaller girl home while she cries. In my dream life, a gray mist creeps over my kingdom. I grow a mouthful of baby teeth scream when it rains. I banish slippery smiled people from my kingdom, the ones who throw parties and tell me I'm pretty. I tell them to wrap their belongings on their backs, tie them up with the linen sack and leave, go, be gone. I sit alone in my opalescent tower and the gray mist shuts all of the flower eyes. In my real life, I get a grant from the French department to study abroad. I eat lavender flavored gelato and watch jugglers on unicycles maneuver ancient alleyways. I'm old enough to drink in the south of France, so my new friends and I buy cheap wine that tastes like vinegar and dance sur le pont d'Avignon. In my dream life, the mist trembles and I can see flashes of color behind it. The remaining inhabitants of my kingdom, the talking animals and plant poets, say there is a 
sensibility that the gray days may be lifting. They talk about me, shut up in my tower like an ancient evil. My white owl tries to preen me, but I don't have any feathers. In my real life, I go to Myrtle Beach and I lose track of a friend at a party. In the morning, I get a call from the local jail. They lead her out in shackles and an orange jumpsuit. A boy ripped her clothes off on the beach and she ran away naked and the cops threw her in jail for being indecent. In my dream life, the lightning comes. It irradiates the mists and kills the green grass and turns the toads reciting Shakespeare to stone. The lightning strikes the tower over and over again and all of my baby teeth scream. In my real life, I meet the man I'll marry at a party. I move to Berlin, move back. I get married. I work long, hard jobs that don't require me to use my brain. I get called sweetie and sunshine and bitch by various bosses and people who call the office on the phone. In my dream life, the earth is scorched, but all of my screaming baby teeth have fallen out. I add them to my crown, which drips with blood. There are words banging on the doors of my opal tower, begging admittance to my abandoned kingdom, so I let them in. Vowels who aren't afraid of me, but sing lo loud, low tunes of mourning and love, consonants that chuckle and skip all around me. I smile a gummy smile. In my real life, my husband and I move from the worst apartment in the world to a better apartment, and I get into grad school. My boss gives me a nice purse as a parting gift. Our new apartment is overrun with mice, so we adopt a cat. In my dream life, the vowels and consonants weave themselves together in a pattern that becomes people. Characters, they tell me, and I will write about them. I feel a new set of teeth, big and strong, like a horse's teeth grow in. I smile a fat white smile and order the revived toads to fetch me a pen. We float up to the top of my ancient tower until our heads brush up against the bioluminescent mushrooms that sprout from the roof, glowing pink and green and blue. I write my name on the toad's skin and they shiver with happiness. In my real life, my cat purrs, my husband makes me pancakes, and there is sunshine coming through our bay window in the mornings. In grad school, my professors tell me not to write about dreams. <laughs> the end of that one. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's like one big long paragraph. Uh, <laughs> so I'll try to, I'll break up one. I'll get one that's like a little bit less than that. Let's see, let's see. I'm trying to find the one about tattoos. I don't know, this is the one about tarot cards. Maybe I'll do that one. <laughs> okay, here's one. Here's one that has more dialogue and less um, interiority. <laughs> and uh, it's called Does Your Tattoo Mean Something? Uh, which was published by the Nashville Review, which I highly recommend. They're very nice people. I like them very much. And they paid me $100, which is... Okay. Uh, at night, my neighbor's tattoos come to me and spill all their secrets. I'm worried that people can tell I'm shallow when they look at me. A monarch butterfly who pulled herself off my neighbor's ankle says, I sigh, I get out of bed, I put the kettle on. You know that's not a productive thought pattern, I tell the butterfly. It's cold, so I retreat to my bedroom and get another sweater. There are holes in the walls of my row house between the apartments upstairs, downstairs, and beside me. The wind and the mice and the tattoos come through. I'm worried that people think I'm stupid, a Komodo dragon clumsily drawn says as he stomps his way in for a cup of tea. He likes it strong and black, even though it's well past midnight. More likely they'll think you're compensating for something, I tell him. He is compensating, the butterfly says. Bitch, says the dragon. Behave, I tell them both. New neighbors moved in next door at the beginning of the month. They have a baby whose whales travel through the gaps in the floorboards. I don't know if the mother has tattoos because the tattoos can only crawl away once their bodies are asleep. The father has a Smith's lyric, though. And if you ever need self-validation, just meet me in the alley by the railway station, he says every time he visits. Can't you think for yourself? The butterfly asks. I love my daughter, but I'm worried that if I get too happy, I'll lose a part of my identity, the Smith's lyric says. My mother died alone, and I regret not being there, the butterfly says. There's only so much you can control, I say. I started buying St. John's wart for the sad sack tattoos, the crying Madonnas, the melancholy quotes, the portraits of the dead. One grandmother 
wreathed in daisies isn't so much sad to be dead as she is angry at the tattoo artist. He fucked up my teeth, the grandmother says. I had nice teeth in real life. It's better to be a little ugly, the Smith lyric says. It makes you seem more true. Oh, for Christ's sakes, says the butterfly. They sit around my couch with me and drink their tea my cat comes in and meows at them a bit but she doesn't scare them even if she is a monster of legend to the mice that's a pretty cat a new tattoo says a wobbly ohm sign peeled from the base of my downstairs neighbor's necks she used to be a hippie but now she has a welcome mat that says come back with a warrant don't tell her that it'll go to her head i say I never once looked at my body and thought, I'm beautiful, the ohm says. The kitchen is getting crowded. Everyone is getting tattoos. Stars peel themselves off in crescents from the curve of my neighbor's ear and hang from my ceiling. Calligraphy unsticks itself from the smalls of their backs and curls at my feet, breathing dead lovers' names. Whole sleeves of blooming flowers unfold and strain upwards from my countertops towards my feeble ceiling light. There are a few goofy cartoon characters and old stick and pokes who faded into greenish blobs. Their worries are always the same. I'm afraid I'm not young and the world isn't what I thought it would be. My grandson is having an affair with his therapist, the grinning grandmother says. I used to have affairs, the Komodo dragon says, but I'm not good looking anymore. I never got any tattoos, not when it was truly transgressive and then not again once everyone I knew had them. My mother told me you couldn't be buried in a Jewish cemetery if you had a tattoo. Turns out that's not true, but it's for the best. I don't want pieces of myself peeling away in the night to tell insomniacs that I feel bad about my body or that I'm worried I will ruin every good thing I get from wanting it too much. When the sun starts to rise, the tattoos slink away. Some of them thank me for the tea. They disappear through the walls, following the mice and the music, the fights and the sex and the silent sobs. I wash all the teacups as Pink Dawn creeps in. And that is the end of that one. I don't know. <laughs> uh, is that enough? Should I read one more or should I stop? Nodding. <laughs> Everyone nodding. I will read one more because I have this whole book. <laughs> you are all very nice. Okay. Let's see. Here's a nice one. Here's just a nice one <laughs> published by the Jellyfish Review, who are also nice people. Just about how much I love my husband. <laughs> uh, so we'll go off on a high note. It's called Tortoises. Centuries ago, my love, you and I were a mated pair of giant Galapagos tortoises. We lived our lives shelled into slowness. I stretched my neck out towards a plant. You stretched your neck out towards a plant. The waves lapped. We had no natural predators. Far away from us, people got into boats and murdered each other and spread like lichen across rocks. You and I were nothing but slow love and warm sun for 100 years. Today, we're going to Home Depot to buy a new toilet seat. The toilet seat our landlord installed in our apartment was too big for the toilet and cracked when we sat on it. What about the kind with a cushion, you ask, holding a toilet seat up so that it makes an oval around your face like a frame? But how much is that one? That one is $25.99, and we feel like we shouldn't pay that much money for a new toilet seat. When we complained to our landlord, he replaced the cracked toilet seat with an identical $7.99 toilet seat. It was also too big and also cracked because our toilet is too close to our tub to sit straight on. Our apartment is small. There were mice, but we got a cat. We are nothing more than married humans this time. What if we got the same one as last time, I ask? But we'll just crack it again, you say. You're frowning in earnest at a ro row of toilet seats, and my heart fills up with love. But shouldn't the landlord replace it again, I ask? I am already thinking about the Asian supermarket we're going to after this and the $1 Korean face masks I can buy for every woman in my life to hound out like little sheets of happiness in the weeks to come. I like to get cucumber for my mother, gold for my sister guineas for my friends. Life is hard. Sit still for a moment with a mask on your face. I remember the virtue of slowness from our past life. I just don't want our lives to become a battle about a toilet seat, you say. Let's get the nice one. What are we, millionaires? I ask, but my eyes are already lit up at the thought of sitting on a comfortable 
toilet seat, the kind that fussy old ladies have. It seems like a silly thing to spend $26 on, but we never make silly purchases. We can always take it with us when we go, you say. I like it when you say when we go, eyes to the future, like a sailor on the prow of a ship. I clutch the toilet seat to my chest while we wait in line to pay. You pick the line that's moving the fastest because spotting the fastest cashier is one of your talents. This is a nice one, the cashier says, holding the toilet seat up to the overhead fluorescent lights. Thanks, you say. My eyes are dazzled by the light on the toilet seat cover, glinting like the tropical sun off of a hard brown shell. The end. <laughs> Thank you very much. You are all very kind, and I and I very much appreciate all of your kind comments that I will now scroll and read. All in the thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Deirdre. I think I speak for everyone here when we 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 were entranced. I doubted every tattoo ideation I've ever had, and now I will look. At, I'll never look at a toilet seat the same way again. Which I, feels like it shouldn't be a bad thing, but it's like a warm and a fuzzy thing, which is not what I expected. Um, anyhow, that was the incomparable Deirdre Donklin, whose um, How to Start a Coven is forthcoming from Variant Lit. You can follow Deirdre's exploits, writing, etc. at um, Donklin Deirdre, so D-A-N-K-L-I-N, D-E-I-R-D-R-E -E -E on Twitter, and you can check out uh, DeirdreDonklin.com, the website where you can keep up with Deirdre's publications and just all the awesome stuff going on. And if you want to, uh, you know, find some of those Jellyfish Review, etc., um, publications to revisit the toilet seat situation, you can do that at your at your leisure. Um, wow, so that was really cool. I'm so excited how much prose has happened tonight. It's like not a velocity my brain is used to, so I'm like kind of reeling, but I'm also very excited to get into the back half of our reading order, which is full of some incredibly exciting um, returning talents to performance anxiety, the first of whom is Sarah Matson. Sarah Matson has poetry in Bone Bouquet, Impossible Task, Go City Press and elsewhere. Sarah's full-length book of poetry, Personal Fashion, a favorite of mine, was published by Swallowtail Press, and her chapbook, Electric Grandma, is available from another new calligraphy. Sarah's pop culture chapbook of DVD poems, Special Features, is forthcoming from Alien Buddha Press. We got some good Alien Buddha representation tonight as well. She lives in Chicago, where she tweets as at Skeletor Writes, S-K-E-L-E-T-O-R-W-R-I-T-E-S. More of Sarah's poetry can be found at neutralspaces.co slash Sarah Masson, and you're going to hear some of it right now. Sarah, take it away. Thank you so much for joining us, as always. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me back, Tom and Kristen. It's such a joy to be here with all you fabulous folks tonight. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, sorry, my computer is being a little bit goofy, so apologies if it gets all goofball -y. Um <laughs> Anyway, uh, my first few poems tonight are from my forthcoming book with Alien Buddha Press. Um, I'm super excited uh, to share this book. Uh, it's called Special Features. It's got DVD poems in it. Um, it's all pop culture inspired. Um, thanks, I'm super pumped. Uh, it's got a couple of my favorite movies, hopefully a couple of your favorite movies, um, and it's really, really weird. <laughs> So uh, I'd like to start out with a uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show themed poem. Uh, it is one of my favorite films. I guess it's uh, Halloween-ish, um, but it's iconic. Uh, so this poem is called, We're All Lucky. Uh, lucky, lucky, we're all lucky. I'm lucky, she's lucky. Cold corner newspaper on coughed style hair vortex caught mid twirl my shin. Water pistols sputter dry and redirect thoughts to the shredded paper clumps in an unwashed pocket, ready to throw up and back, up and back. Lipstick V smeared across my forehead, crotch grabbing smoke fueled effortless pyramid of curls accentuate my knit socks stuffed into patent leather kitten heels. Baby giraffe knees locked in strobe light rhythm. Glowing past my midriff teen dream, riding on the hood, looking for chrome to huff and a saxophone solo to throttle lightning, illuminating only my eyes. 
stylish joke. Filthy, curious, and aroused, glitter scabbing along the split end, licked words fit for later questions between metal or corsetry release. I admire the full orchestral soundtrack burning child hairs off arms or shoulders, the invisible tattoo of youth itching while foaming spit lubricates metal gears gleaming freshly baked. Oversized plastic sprinkled tits with even larger jelly jar permahard nipples poking through my tiny teen consciousness. Private army of darkness as tumultuous enchantment, outlandish night terror worn like neighborly affection, hidden in the warble, under the surface achievement of sweet sharpness, I strive to maintain even now inside the rasp. Thanks. Um, my, uh, Next poem tonight uh, is also from Special Features. Uh, it's a tercet, uh, and it's inspired uh, by Edward Scissorhands. Uh, this is called Hold Me. Waist deep bouffant, pastel silver and weightless, mid-career estheticians. Hi, mom. <laughs> Lush and groovy topiary existence, slender and cold blades haunting the profound. He was my grandfather, how all kindly old men are related to me by blood or sadness or diner food. Honey soaked private affirmations, rolling posy pink like a lover's moisture down my throat. In conjunction with slinky blonde devotee, snow spiral, deeply romantic, cold nostalgia gently floating down to earth like overgrown fringe. Honor the ancient magic with vibrant organ or devilish hedge trimmed in velvet. Seminal collection of signature beehives, stark and impersonal pastel, electric against plasticized suburbs. Not bad, just weird. Is there a difference? Polished alternative in laminated metallic or thick tubes, weighty regrets worn as a nostalgia, worn as a reminder of how nostalgia ages as memory soaks my tongue. Oh, thanks, y'all. Uh, I got one more from uh, Special Features, um, and this <laughs> is called Space Witch. It is inspired by Power Rangers. Um, choose your Power Ranger film. I thought the new one was pretty fun. Uh, it's called Space Witch. <laughs> Lording over my putty plants, tiny buds glow upwards, stretching moments into days. Stagnant nostalgia pulling my thick sky blue hair, wavy into horns bound in clay. Puff sleeve soaks my arm, making movements slow, purposeful. I fill my jug with shrieks, admire wattage density, brilliance of my infused power, one million childhood tears staining our feet beneath the toy aisle, droplets of vitamin green, but probably just food coloring. <laughs> I remain intergalactic sorceress of dumpster moon freedom. Dreams don't exist, only reality, the absolute truth of prehistoric hue. Punching holes through muscle wall, inspiring a generation to wear your own skin like a cape and fly. Uh, my very last poem tonight is a uh, brand new shit because I really love new shit for performance anxiety. It's so exciting. Uh, thank you for letting me try this out. Um, this is called Planet Arium. Perception of love as blood were dying in a hurry, wet and vicious, perpetually stinking of vast insignificance or the structural integrity of wax a candle's dream. 
I cut my place in dust, soaring past hangnails and summer backseat casualness. Tender bladed lake cycle, I remain of the visible light spectrum. Unappreciated by metals or hungry planets and intoxicated by memory, pinhole brightness bloated from the past, well-worn considering. Tantalized, I'm a famished galaxy, whoring my darkness how stars crawl effortlessly. One shoulder bare, cheaply dyed sheets catch on my still shimmering vision. Vibrant fingertips seeking the same holes embroidered in every heart. I bottle orange and brightly innocuous dreams while you sit lurid in beautiful curves, sipping mind wine, chewing the clots, incompatible with daytime bravery. We glow in the dark until we don't. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time tonight. I'm Sarah Matson. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being here. Asparagus came over just to hear your set and knew that you were done, so ran away again. But that, again, was Sarah Matson, artisan of the phrase, uh, who just does the most amazing things. Um, and uh, you can find Sarah's work and Sarah's uh, being on Twitter at Skeletor Writes, S-K-E-L-E-T-O-R-W-R-I-T-E-S. And keep an eye out for special features DVD poems, which will be out November 14th from Alien Buddha Press. I think someone said in the chat earlier, they were like, Payday cannot come soon enough at the end of this reading because we've heard from so many amazing new books. Um, and we're just so thrilled that, you know, everyone has been able to share this and it's been beautiful. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce our penultimate reader tonight in Marissa Silva Dunbar. Marissa Silva Dunbar's work has been published in Analogies and Allegories, Pink Plastic House, and Sledgehammer Lit. Her second chapbook, When Goddesses Wake, was released in December 2021 from Maverick Duck Press. You can find her on Twitter and Instagram at the Sweet Maris, T H E S W E E T M A R I S. Um, her first full length collection, Allison, was recently published by Querencia Press, Q U E R E N C I A Press. Um, and you can check out more of her work at marissasilvadunbar.com and you'll hear some of it right now. Thank you so much, Marissa, for joining us. Take it away. Thank you. Um, all the poems I'm going to be reading tonight are actually from Allison. I was inspired with the recent um, premiere of The Vow Part 2 on HBO Max. Um, actually, my first poem that I'm going to read was written after one of the episodes in the first season where we get to see where Allison Mack um, met Keith Raniere, who is the Nexium cult leader, and basically um, convinced... Through the Nexium process, was able to convince a group of women to start a smaller subsect where they were going to become his personal sex slaves. So I am reading for that. Allison, I feel, um, doubles as both victim and perpetrator, and I hope to capture that. So here's my first piece. The introduction, November 14th, 2006. We are now witness to the origin Here's where he ensnares you. You are mesmerized, girlish, giggly, and desperate for your worth to be seen by this man, a sweatband and knee pads. We know it's just a seedy facade. Some of us have at one point wanted to be loved by a mediocre man. He already sees you as prey, already wants to break you into bite-sized pieces. You crumble so easily. Gulping sobs as he destroys your joy. Calls it artificial. He wants you to become reliant on him. To find true exaltation. You dissolve. <clears throat> so my collection is a mix of original poetry and remixed poems from Allison Mack's own blog and the Frank Report. This is a piece from her or blog. Um, 25th, 2014, like, found home on Allison Mack's website. She was the first of his lovers I watched perish. After they shaved her head, it wasn't long until her body followed. It's a rapid descent when we are no longer useful. 
the last time I saw her, she gave a speech at a friend's wedding. Ashen, 80 pounds of flesh and muscle, twisted around a skeletal frame. Most of his, women's tran most of his women transform into ghastly creatures. That night, we drank champagne and danced to the Jackson 5. Celebration is annihilation. So, um, two of Keith's former lovers that lived with him, this was prior to the subsect of the cult DOS um, being started, um, died um, of cancer. And so there, some people are questioning if he definitely had a role in that. So that was actually a poem about one of his women that Allison wrote at, about this wedding that they went to. This other one was inspired by the vow um, and something Mark Vicente said during one of his interviews. Wonderstruck. There is something not stable about her. And she's got this gaggle of women that she's mentoring that are not doing well. Mark Vicente. The young ingenue playing the witty and pretty best friend to the super. You're the Pied Piper. These women want to follow you into the unknown. They trust you to lead them through fields towards a bright sky blue salvation. They don't see you grasping at the air, trying to steady yourself, how your own eyes are wrapped 100 times with cellophane. They don't know the tune inside your head leads you and them to the cliffs, how even if you all survive the fall, shore and serenity are more than a day's swim away. The melody haunts you. You want it to feel like warm caramel. You want these women to feast on your wisdom, worship you like a goddess, bring you lotus blossoms, marigolds, and roses. Pretend you are floating instead of rapidly sinking into quicksand. Thank you. Um, this is actually one of the first pieces from the collection that was published back in 2018. Um, it found, I believe it was published in Mojave Heart Review, um, but it also lives on Kristen's um, The Lost Library in the Pink Plastic House. November 5th, 2014. You know those days. Found poem from Allison Mack's blog. This morning I melted. The pressures of my fears liquefying me. The closeness of humans, their desires, their wills, Crush me until all I can do is weep space. Yards of grass, a city block, a highway in the desert, an indigo ocean raging away from land, miles of stardust. I disappear. A constant refrain whispers in the idle hours. Be anyone but you. See the cracks in you. Repair what parts of you that still have a chance. Rewind to a time before you were broken. Wake up. Um, and this is my last piece. Um, there's a lot of the language um, when people first start coming out of a cult, um, they call it waking up. And I know a lot of people have wondered if like within that have left or haven't been in contact with her, um, wonder if she is awake now. And that was one of my big questions as I was writing this collection. Would she wake up or would she remain loyal to Keith after everything, after he's been using her as a scapegoat essentially? Are you awake now, Allison? Or are you still slumbering away under a bed of leaves dreaming of Albany? Tell us, you've started sanitizing the sleep from your eyes, have wandered through the forest of nightmares you created under the command of an impotent master. Show us you see the tapeworm he is. We know he fed on you, made you weak and dizzy, how he grew bloated as he drained the nutrients from your body during your 20s and 30s. Prove you removed him from your being, have swallowed the medicine, went under the knife so that every bit is gone and no new toxicity can hatch. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Marissa, for sharing those pieces with us. That again was Marissa Silva Dunbar, proving that, you know, I said in the chat that there's so much range here in this room tonight in terms of poetry, in terms of prose, in terms of genre, um, and just everything. It was so beautiful. And again, you can um, keep up with Marissa's amazing work um, by finding her on the socials at The Sweet Maris, T H E S W E E T M A R I S. And keep an eye out for that first full length collection, Allison. It was recently published by Carencia Press. And you can find it at marissasilvadunbar.com, M-A-R-I-S-A-S-I-L-V-A-D-U-N-B-A-R.com. Wow. All right. We've been we've been through all sorts of like the emotional timbres we've experienced, the the toilet seats, the everything has all led us to this moment. Um, it's always a little bit bittersweet to introduce the last reader of the evening, but I'm excited to do it tonight. Another returner to performance anxiety in Anthony Tyler. Um, Anthony, before I introduce him, I just wanted to mention he, he and I met when we had a reading in New Jersey for uh, Light Up Swan, which is my first book of poems. Um, and it was so cool to just get to meet him and talk with him a little bit about poetry. Um, and we've been so glad to have him on performance anxiety once before and now again tonight. Um, Anthony is from Lebanon, New Jersey. Um, um, Anthony's been reading and writing poetry on and off since high school. The best time, I think, to start writing poetry. Uh, Rimbo's birthday is today, I think, so that feels apropos. Um, Anthony's not been published anywhere yet, but the first place that will have that privilege will be very lucky. Um, some of his influences include Ginsburg, Poe, Reed, Lou Reed, Robert Frost, William Carlos Williams, Bukowski, and Burroughs. So, Anthony, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Take it away. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so... I have two new poems, which I plan on reading tonight, and uh, one older poem from my community college days. Um, I've been very busy with uh, college, so poetry really kind of got put on the back burner, but I was definitely going to have something for tonight. So first poem I've got is the older one. It's called, it kind of goes with Halloween a little bit because it's about murder. It's called uh, Pretty in Red. Worked hard labor, uh, worked hard labor, Gave much love, gave little hate, away for days. Found comfort in drink, the man he was. Did little work, wanted more money. Felt shame for greed, could not resist. Another man came to the door. It loved her white dress, the woman she was. A warm night in July, welcomed him back. With a man named Jim in his sack. Oh, apologies, oh, excuses. She wore bright white, he made Jim stand. Consciously, with knife in hand, Jim's throat slashed. The dress painted, she nearly fainted. As Jim lay dead, he thought her so pretty in red. Okay. These are the two new poems I wrote for tonight. Both have to do with common vices that I'm sure many people are familiar with. This is called The Liquor Store Supreme. Hazy days are here and starvation nights. Numbness of the brain and fantastic chlorine dreams. All hail, they cried, to the liquor store supreme. The gray-haired people of the barbed wire tattoo. What a tiresome tribe. Special douchebags. All hail, they cried, to the liquor store supreme. Children of Jack Daniels, old granddad and Jaeger too. Fight those cigar-toting bastards. Be gone with California winos and nauseating beer bellies of the hills. Such perfect assholes with bad teeth and their tobacco grins. They understand nothing, no taste, no class. All hail, all hail. All hail, they cried to the liquor store supreme. And then the last poem I have for tonight... Hold on. This is called Marlboro Kiss. Let me be clear with you. I need it right now. Right this minute, goddammit. More than whiskey sour. More than sex. And in the morning, too. Watch the dew and ragged tobacco. Hazily experience hard orgasms together in the sun's bed. Any meaningful jobs in this small town are irrelevant right now. I'll give up college for exactly 15 minutes. 
I'll tell you, I'm fucking dying. Just dying for it. Sweating, shaking, pining, like a sophisticated idiot. Sweet brownish gray leaves. Feels like 18th century paper. Wrapping your stained fingers around my chest in a dark bar in Hoboken, on the steps at St. Mark's Place, behind the town library, which was burned down by Zoomers, in wet subways of yesteryear, 1947 probably, at the Essential University for useless bullshit, in the store parking lot that smells of piss. I want it again sometimes. Just a quick taste, please, of the lovely Marlboro kiss. And uh, that's all I've got for tonight. Thank you so much, Anthony, for sharing those poems with us and for participating in the great performance anxiety tradition of a new shit. That again was Anthony Tyler. And again, um, the publication of those or other poems, we are very excited uh, when, and keep us posted for the forthcoming news when that happens, because we will be very excited to to read them and to follow them. Um, yeah, so wow, we are we are at the end of our October 2022 reading, which is always again getting to this point is both a a distinct pleasure because we got to hear so much amazing stuff tonight in such a varied level again of genres of of work. We just had so many different awesome things happening. Um, it was quite a ride, but I was so glad to be on it with all of you. So thank you so so much to all of our readers for sharing their beautiful work with us this evening, and thank you to our listeners whether you're here with us live um, and cheering our readers on in the chat or if you're listening um, on YouTube thank you for giving this hour of your life over to poetry um, I really really hope if you're listening uh, with a spooky assortment of new poems close at hand um, or just new shit you want to try reading and see what people feel about it um, because as uh, Deirdre I think said I want to adopt that like we're kind of weird so like you know if you, you can bring that here um, please consider dropping us a line at performance anxiety on Twitter p-e-r-f-o-r-m-a-n-c-e-a-n-x-t on Twitter or you can email me Tom Snarsky at gmail.com send us a dm something like that we would love to have you at a future event our next reading is going to be november 17th and i cannot tell you how excited i am the great poet norma cole is going to be joining us along with a few other people like i am over the moon thrilled about that and so it's going to be a great time we'll also be celebrating joe yanni's new chat book um which called inside 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 which just came out uh, or is coming out like on Monday. So it's going to be an amazing reading. Um, I want to close, as I always do, performance anxiety by reading uh, a poem, but that's not by me. It's by um, the great poet Deborah Diggs, who we lost, unfortunately, way too early. Um, I'm wearing my Honkus Ponkus shirt, so I have the proper uniform on for this poem, which is called The Hokey Pokey. This is from her book, Late in the Millennium, which is, I think, from 1988 or 1989. Look. The leaves are changing, and all over the neighborhood, in apartment house front yards, on balconies, the booths go up, just two by fours and siding. The entrances are flowered bedsheets someone's made love on, or surely, or lying against a wall, hugged himself to sleep. Evenings below the roar of inbound jets, their landing lights visible for miles, below a children's record, the hokey pokey, blasting from the retirement home's basement windows. You can hear the men inside, their Sukkot in the language of the ancestors singing what saved them in the wilderness. Yesterday, my half-grown son and I carried a dollhouse from the curb and painted and repaired the roof, the broken stair, papered the walls with remnants from our old clothes from all the houses we remember. It was a kind of worship one of us sooner or later a witness to the other's faith. Turning to dress one year in attic rooms, I was embarrassed and he knew to look away. We live in what is called the habitable zone. Pitching our orbit a little to the north or south, we'd freeze or burn. I know a man who'll tell you with conviction he's spoken with the aliens. <laughs> he weeps as Basil weeps. They challenge you, it isn't fun. Another man sits all day by the bank. He speaks to anyone in riddles. There's only one winner. Who's that? Asks a stranger. Think about it. He spits as a tag. So the days go. The dead father resurrected, inert to animate, hocus pocus. I brought a cat just on cue for hocus pocus. Father put away while radio telescopes from West Coast mountains beam hellos to the heavens solid or cloud brightening bodies. Quote, searched five close galaxies, found nothing, end quote. Searched all the sky, found nothing. Searched, found nothing. 
The residents of the retirement home, maybe this guy soon, join hands. Say they dance tonight in a world they'd swear is not of their making. Born again of God or godless, dance to kill the time. The prayers go up like static, whole bloodlines in 30 zeroed combinations toward Epsilon, Eridani, Alpha Centauri, Orion, Zion, Salem on the horizon. Just as the dancers change the record, now they're moving in rhythm to the center of the circle, their arms raised in a bower through which one and then another and then another passes, passes a little shyly like a bride.